Now I will try briefly to describe the architecture or the yeah, the architecture of the intelligent real-time control systems. Uh, briefly, because it's a big topic, and I, so I will try because I'm not an expert on this area. Um, but I was very impressed, and I'm sure some of you are going to have to deal with um, architecture of, for example, real-time autonomous systems. You might be working in the uh, motor vehicle industry. Uh, or robots, and who knows what else in the future. Now, the origins of these intelligent, these real-time intelligent control systems actually started with um, autonomous vehicles, and the military is the biggest driver of uh, that effort. But more recently, it spread out a bit to um, a number of other areas, including uh, autonomous, um, just autonomous commercial vehicles. Um, consumer vehicles. So almost every um, vehicle manufacturer now has some program to try and build some form of autonomous vehicle. There's also this question of robots. Um, the Where the robots are uh, uh, not simply doing repetitive actions, when they're not just a, a bigger, smarter industrial machine, when they have some level of autonomy, they have to have a real-time intelligent autonomous system. Now the real-time uh, control system, there is a reference model available. It's uh, freely available from the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in America, NIST. And if you just Google real-time intelligent control systems, you can find uh, reference to it. Now, it is a reference model not a system design. It's suited to autonomous vehicles and robots. It's designed to enable any level of intelligent behavior. All right. It's, it was inspired by a theoretical model of the cerebellum in your brain. Um, now, that's one interesting part of it. I, I didn't look into too much of the details of that, but it sounds interesting. Now, the difference between this and most other uh, real-time systems is that this system maintains a model of the world and essentially it, it, it uh, takes measurements and, and uh, signals from the world, it senses the world and updates this model and uses that model to predict what sort of actions it ought to do next as opposed to simply um, getting signals from the, the world and responding directly to those signals. Real-time control system decision making um, the, the sequence of events, and if, if there is such a thing as a sequence of events, the sensors and sensory input re gets the uh, sensors all the data about the real world and updates the model. Now from there, behavior generation submits uh, tentative plans to the world model, and the world model generates expected results and sends it to value judgment. Right, so, uh, right, and value judgment um, weighs up the, the benefits, the risks, the costs, the, the drawbacks, and decides what to do. Um, now, my understanding is that it approves or not the planned actions. It doesn't, it doesn't itself generate the actions, it simply says which ones are going to be um, implemented, uh, acted upon. And then the actuators interact with the environment. Okay, so we have this model where you get your data in, you update the world model, there's a, there's a um, behavior generation that um, is, ha knows of goals and plans actions to achieve those goals, it generates some plans, submits these to the um, value judgment um, part of the system, it makes decisions, hands them back, um, the behavior generation or something then hands them to the actuators uh, for action. The elements of the intelligent uh, systems, we have uh, behavior generation and actuation, this is planning and control. The sensing and sensory processing, so it filters, detects, recognize, interpret, this, this is uh, input signals from the, from the external world. There's world modeling, so they're storing knowledge and uh, predicting knowledge. Um, now, representing the world is a pretty big and interesting question. Value judgment, this is where um, the cost, benefits, 
attributes, maps, sorry, cost, benefits, and uncertainty is, uh, is uh, determined as best they can. Uh, knowledge, this, uh, the knowledge module where the states, events, entities, attributes, maps, tasks, and processes are, are stored. And then we have the system architecture, which has to, has to deal with communication between all the um, separate parts of the system. It's not one single system. It's a, a number of cooperating systems, as we will discover. So there's a lot of communication, a lot of timing, and um, there are various operating systems um, that are part of it. Now, the organization of intelligent systems. Basically, behavior generation receives goals and generates actions. Right? Sensory processing receives, observes, input and generates reports. And the whole idea is to reward success and punish behavior. Um, I can just imagine a you know, bad program, but no, it um, punishes or reduces the value of or something of that nature. Um, so that's the the uh, the organisation of it and the the way it behaves. Essentially, it it gets information, decides what to do, <clears throat> tries something, records the success or failure of that, and modifies its values accordingly. And in terms of managing complexity. Um, this is done very much in a hierarchical fashion. Uh, the, the entire diagram is, is uh, too big to put on a PowerPoint slide and you couldn't see it. Um, the complexity is managed through hierarchical layering of computation nodes. And the higher the layer, the uh, longer planning horizons and less detail. So um, there's, a, there's about a seven or ten layer model of it. And uh, right at the bottom you're dealing with um, nanosecond and microsecond responses. Uh, it goes up so that you're dealing with, um, say, um, five second response and then, then 30 second response and, and um, 10 minute, one day, one week, a year. Um, they are the various planning horizons uh, of the various levels. And so, um, obviously, the, the more coarse grain, the, planning, the longer the planning horizon, the less detailed you can be, the more abstract the goal has to be. And so well, we, we're trying to achieve that goal. And as you go down to the final level, the more uh, fine grained, the more real and immediate become the goals and the actions. Now, how do you build these things? The engineering methodology. All right. Well, they, they begin apparently with scenario analysis and, and they get um, very detailed um, behavior requirements. Um, so they want to know exactly what sort of behavior they want, uh, the constraints, the uh, operational behavior, and that uh, they put a lot of effort into that. I mean, if you are going to build things that are going to cost several million dollars, you can take the time to do it. They define, next is defined a hierarchy of um, task vocabularies. Uh, so you have a hierarchy of tasks and each one of those has a vocabulary. That enables you to develop a world model because you have to model um, that information that is necessary to support those tasks. You then um, define the sensors and the sensory processing algorithms to provide the information that can update those models and you define the set of messages and communication protocols between all the different parts of the system. Now, it's, it's not as if you can do that just straight away. Um, it apparently it takes a number of iterations to um, put all this together and to allow it to stabilize. Now the, the conclusions that are drawn from that is that this is not for beginners. Um, this is um, highly complex programming. Intelligent systems are typically too complex to be designed and developed using conventional programming practices. So there are some fairly esoteric programming practices that come in and some highly rigorous practices that come in. So if you're going to go into these, you probably need to have a lot of um, experience before anyone will let you loose on them.